All right, with that, hello everyone. Welcome to Phoenixville Public Library. Uh, I'm Mark Pinto, the Director of Adult Services. Uh, you, those on Zoom can't see me, but welcome to you and welcome to those in the room. We're delighted to have with us tonight two local authors, uh, one of whom we've had uh, with us virtually uh, in the past, uh, Nancy Schwartz and her co-author April Beard, authors of the book Up Bow, Down Bow, about Nancy's son Alex and the power of music to transcend his disability. And it's a remarkable story and they're both here to share it tonight. Please give them a warm welcome. life happening or challenge, blessing or obstacle, it is Alex who brings the music of our lives together to create a sweet symphony along with my other sons, Joshua and Sam. Sometimes the song is offbeat, other times the instruments aren't always in tune, but more often than not, I want to cry at the beauty of the orchestra. Being Alex's parent, there are no solos. He requires accompaniment, and as a result of that, we've had the beautiful experience of surrounding ourselves with people who cherish, adore, guide him, and thereby make all of our lives better. Of course, my primary support and companion on this journey is Michael, my husband and Alex's father. And there are too many others to enumerate, but those that come immediately to mind are Alex's extraordinary nurse, Nurse Tracy, his special education teacher, Megan Lindsay, speech therapist and eye gaze specialist, Barb Davis, and his physical therapist, Emma Mason. We love her, although Alex hates her for making him use his muscles. His occupational therapist, Casey Brown, his previous special education teacher, Kim Gambone, and the personal care assistant, Kristen Culligan, Kristen Culligan, who took the cover photo for this book and accompanied Alex to his first entire year of cello lessons. And of course, there's April. Now I'm gonna read from Alex's voice, so as if I were Alex, Alex. I feel so special and blessed. I absolutely love my family. They do so much for me. I love the school I go to. My teachers and friends are the best. I love the world. <clears throat> Mom and Dad, even though I may not make you Mother's or Father's Day cards or tell you how much I love you, I hope you know I do. I hope you know I think you are the best Mom and Dad in the whole wide world. Here, let me play a song for you. Of his team. Alex does not walk or talk yet, but he's been playing the cello with April for four years. Um, so I'm going to read a part that I guess kind of gets more into like some of the technical, I think, or um, I guess nitty gritty things. Um, so for Alex, whose trisomy 21 is correlated with hypotonia, there is no denying the correlation between musculature and music. His hypotonia means the two of us, aided by Nancy, need to understand and gauge his levels of strength and flexibility within his arms, hands, and shoulders at each and every lesson. For this reason, and other reasons like instilling a sense of independence and initiation, Nancy and I never want to force Alex to do a movement on the cello when we guide him. Like in my own viola playing and to all my students, I try to refer to our actions on the strings as weighing down or weight. Our arms, hands, and the bow obviously all have weight to them. So using the natural weight of the bow and arm into the string is helpful for both those who tend to tense up and for those who perhaps have a condition like Alex where the muscles may not always be able to consistently activate. For the most part, we are able to rest. And no, that is another surprisingly easier said than done thing. Resting the arm and bow and letting gravity do the work is an important skill to learn. Watching old lessons with Alex enabled me to pick up on subtle cues and shifts, not merely in his movements, but in his pre-movements. I think it's kind of like how 
when anyone's listening to music. Most people can almost subconsciously predict when a chord is about to change, or when a chorus is about to come back in, or when the beat will drop. We will feel the buildup of music, and I could see Alex becoming ready for movements in tandem with the repetitive movements we practice, or an auditory cue. The additional gift of the videos was that in sharing the videos with Nancy, it began to feel like we were and are two maestros conducting a beautiful symphony together, noticing and pointing out all of Alex's cool learning movements. After Nancy watched each lesson, she provided information that has helped me learn more about Alex and the way he communicates. For example, she shared with me how blowing raspberries means he's loving what he's doing, and tapping his chin with its fingers in the shape of the letter W means he's thirsty. She pointed out that he raises his body up when he hears a higher pitch. She takes screenshots from the videos and say, look how proud he looks. Through her eyes, I started to see and learn how expressive Alex is. Ultimately, that unlocked a whole vault of knowledge and assessment tools where I could watch Alex and assess his ways of applying knowledge and showing understanding. I began to realize the various ways Alex is conducting and co-creating, like a third conductor in our symphony, and I became more adept at taking my, taking my cues from him. <clears throat> when I received the instrument interest form with its single question, which instrument would you like your child to learn, and limited multiple choice answers, I thought, he's not going to be able to do any of these, so why are they even bothering to send this to me? Waves of frustration washed over me. Throughout my years with Alex, I've marveled at my youngest son's abilities, joys, and radiant spirit. But that doesn't mean I don't feel frustrated when he can't do things his peers seem so easily able to accomplish. I'm never sad about my son's limitations for me, but I do want him to experience a wider, more expansive life. And reminders of what he can't do make me sad and angry. The form felt mean. Alex didn't walk yet or talk yet. He found it challenging to hold a pencil. There was no way he'd be able to join the orchestra. My heart sank, and then it soared. What if Alex could experience even some small measure of music? What if he could learn to play? Here was the opportunity for a new experience, and I didn't want my youngest deprived of anything. Josh played the cello, I played, and still sometimes play the cello. I wished Alex could play the cello, so I pushed down my doubts. I filled in the box marked cello. Another form showed up the next day. It instructed me to rent a quarter-sized cello. Really? Well, here it goes. I rushed to the music and art store in Wayne, Pennsylvania. I need a quarter-sized cello, a bow, some rosin, and Suzuki Book One, I told the young man behind the counter. He wrote Alex in big black letters on a tag and attached the tag to the soft instrument case. I thought about the letters we hung on my third son's bedroom door even before bringing him home from the hospital, and smiled at the inner acknowledgement of how our lives with Alex had far exceeded our expectations. Alex had exceeded our expectations. But as I left the music store clutching Alex's instrument to me, I was far from confident. And yet, the pictures were sent to me of Alex taking his first lesson with his cello teacher, Ava Beard. How did that happen? How did I move from uncertainty to unshakable faith? April Beard. <laughs> <laughs> April is the embodiment of all I had hoped for in a teacher, not just for Alex, but for me. Up until the pandemic, she sent me a weekly multi-paragraph email about pizzicato, piano plucking with a soft dynamic level, bow holding, a cello font, which is a special tool that you use on the, on the bow. No tool, Alex's attention span, percussion, music, and more. After the pandemic hit, I became Alex's cello helper, so there was no need for these ongoing email updates. To get emails about our youngest son's progress filled me with a joy that cannot be put into words. Each week after receiving April's email, it could take me a day to respond. I remained, I remained that blown away, my doubts eviscerated by awe and gratitude. Since being blessed with the gift of my youngest son, I have felt as if I've often had to fight for him to gain access to the same rights and opportunities as his fourth grade peers. But with the cello, Alex is just like any other fourth grader. 
April perfectly balances how to challenge Alex, yet meet him where he needs support. She turned the instrument toward him so he could see and hear. As a result of her tutelage, my son, who others doubted could ever learn to play an instrument, let alone something as intricate and majestic as a cello, can play percussion, do bouncy bowing, and so many other techniques that astonish me. April accepts the level of learning within Alex's current reach while inspiring him to expand his skill set in increments. As a result, Alex is learning. He's also cultivating a love for music. I see this experience as setting the stage for our youngest son to touch the stars, and I marvel at what a miracle he is. As if the photos and emails were not enough, April added to Alex's visual and textual records by beginning to video her lessons with him. Each video she sent gave us all hope and joy. I remember a day 15 weeks into Alex's lessons when I watched him, courtesy of one of these captured moments, and had a striking realization. Alex was progressing not just as a performer, but as a person. Alex has learned a ton about notes. He has experienced stylistic variations. His cello teacher isn't simply teaching him how to play. She's helping him understand that he can do things he never imagined possible. He can learn. This teacher's teaching has been magic. It has illuminated the intelligence we have always known Alex possesses. As a result, he is succeeding in ways I never dreamt possible, ways the world told me he never would. At the time of Alex's birth, there were many people who told me not to have expectations for him. They said things like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. You're gonna put him in an institution, right? And at last, at least, you have Josh and Sam. They treated Alex's birth like a death and couldn't see all the wonder and beauty that Alex would bring to our family and also to the world. Each year since then, although most of Alex's young life has been full of loving, positive people, I found myself suddenly in situations where it feels as if other people are trying to reduce my expectations of my son. These seemingly well-intentioned people want to make Alex's life smaller, not April. I watch enthralled as April issues an instruction and my youngest son takes his entire body and lifts it up higher to show he understands an A string sounds higher than a D string. Every time I watch Alex play, my mind wanders through a maze of memories and I find myself tearing up at the beauty and brilliance. And there's Alex on oxygen when he was first born. He spent a month in the hospital. My youngest boy, Alex's experience with cello have translated into other areas of his life. Since starting the cello, his pincer grasp is better and his grasp on life itself seems to have strengthened. He has started holding objects more at home. He looks at me with a newfound confidence and poise. It is as if when he sees me seeing him, we both recognize that something has changed. He has increased awareness. His sense of self and purpose have grown Seeing Alex respond to the notes and chords of his newfound learning fills us all with a desire to sing just as he fills our life with daily music simply by existing. And this is Alex's voice. It is so cool, Miss Beard turned the cello toward me. I can see all the strings. And she showed me how to get a great sound for the D string and the A string. I love this. I feel so smart and unique. I always wanted to have cello lessons. I remember mom played the Suzuki variations of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and each time she played, it made me want to play too. I'll do one more, um, more about, I suppose, less about the new grade of my lessons. Um, when I began teaching Alex, I could have never conceived of how much the cello would have come to me to him, just as I have never have conceived of how much my own falling in love with string instruments would give shape and substance to my life. But music, like love, softens us. It makes us smile. It animates the dullness that exists within us and gives us a new perspective. Also like love, music emanates from us and radiates outward. The only Alex I have ever known is an Alex full of smiles, a gentle, compassionate, heart-filled student who is eager to learn. I get windows into Alex's life, not doors. Certain of his experiences will remain unfathomable to me. 
Alex has grand mal nocturnal seizures. He endures tough physical therapy sessions and pain from the constant demands to his body that come from navigating the world as a person with low muscle tone. I look at Alex and Nancy and I see some of the strongest people I know. Nancy tells me that music has become a touchstone for their family. On difficult days or after even more difficult nights, our lessons are one small form of embodiment Alex can experience. Though I believe his cello lessons to be a vehicle for working on things like building, like to strength building, eye contact, movement initiation, focus, etc. It is also important that I allow cello lessons to be a place where he can let go of life's stressor, stressors and simply be who he is doing something he loves. There are those moments as a teacher where I can wonder if I'm getting through to students. And I have to remind myself that string lessons might just be a 20 to 30 minute blip on their radar of life. While music is like the sun to me, many things in my life revolving around it, to many of my students, learning an instrument may just be a small star in their infinitely speckled sky. So I think it is important for me to remember to not be diminished by that fact, but instead it can make me inspired to make that little star as bright and meaningful to them as I can, so that perhaps one day it serves as a guide to someplace really special. And this is my last part. <laughs> um, I like to say that challenge is an opportunity to be extraordinary. My favorite music activity is to play duets with Alex on our cellos. I never thought this would be possible. Alex enjoys the language of music now more than ever. Before cello lessons, I'm not sure if Alex felt the beat of music like a musician. But now he listens to music and bops along to the steady beat. I can't thank April enough for her bravery when deciding to teach Alex three years ago. Gustavo Dudamel said in an interview on PBS, everyone deserves access to beauty. I agree 100% with this concept. My heart is full of joy as is Alex's when we hear or play music together. This beauty is felt, it's tangible. Music is a magic miracle uniting us in what's possible. Alex is thriving, and I believe it is because of his cello lessons with April. And you can see this is um, Alex playing the cello with me. <laughs> and on the other page are trees at Stonely, and they have um, something supporting them, just the way Alex has support when he plays the cello. So if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. <laughs> Those on Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself or you can type your question in the chat and I will relay that. April, I have a question for you. So have you had experience teaching uh, other kids like Alex? Um, before him? Before him, before right. Before him, um, no, this was really my first public school um, gig. Uh, before that, I was, I pretty much came straight out of my own. Um, graduate degree. Um, I was just teaching through community schools and um, things before that. So no, I really haven't had too much experience. Um, all I knew was that I just, I, I wanted to teach everyone. You know, I, I love playing string instruments. I, I believe very like wholeheartedly that, that they're amazing and they've done so much for me. So why couldn't they do so much for anyone else? <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you have a music therapy degree? Or? No, I don't. Um, it wasn't offered, I think now it is offered at the school where I went. Um, I went to Crane School of Music in New York, upstate New York. Um, I think they've since added a music therapy degree. But we had one semester of um, special education in music. That was it. So, so I really had to um, you know, bring some of those books out and refer to some colleagues. Nancy, really Nancy's just been most of the, like all the information I need because she knows, she knows her son, you know, so well and um, just taking cues from her and um, using her knowledge too as an educator. Um, I don't, I don't think she gives herself enough credit in this book because <laughs> she really is really supportive of, of our lessons and, um, you know, especially now that they're, they've turned into private lessons, you know, after school. Um, she's always there, and she's always helping, and she's she's always playing along on her cello, which helps a lot. So you know, I I think I I look to her a lot for for my music therapy and music, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So. <laughs>
<laughs> Nancy, do your other sons, Josh and Sam, do they play instruments? So does uh, Alex get to hear them making music? So Josh did play briefly the cello, uh -huh. and then he took up the trombone and quit that. Oh. And so now he's very into painting. He just did one of Robert Oppenheimer, the atomic bomb. Uh -huh. That. He read the biography, so Sam loves music listening. He hasn't really played a lot, maybe a little piano when he was little. Um, but they enjoy seeing Alex play. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> this is Josh's answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> On the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you observed him very intricately, but how, how were you to dynamically integrate mm -hmm. your style of teaching? I don't know if I'm asking the question. No, I, I understand. Yeah, it, um, well, <laughs> what I first did, which like terrified me, is I turned the cello <laughs> around and we studied with the cello facing him for like two years, and I was like, what have I done? I've, I've ruined it. I've done like everything all wrong. Um, and that was, you know, I, I guess my rationale was that he could see the strings, he could reach for them, um, he could see what he was doing rather than having everything completely blind to him. Um, I also wasn't sure if he'd be comfortable with this giant, you know, it leans on you so much, the cello, so I wasn't sure if he'd be comfortable with that. Um, so I, I, I just kind of did it on an impulse, and, and, and I was like, oh my gosh, I really, and it seemed to just, give him what he needed, I think, to interact. And then from there, I said, okay, what are my goals for him? Um, you know, talking with his personal, I think personal care assistant, Kristen, um, was very helpful. And, and she was always there at the beginning of his lessons. Um, she would, you know, kind of say what kind of day he had or what he's working on along with Nancy. I said, okay, well, he has, seems to have goals of um, working on his grasp and increasing strength on his grasp. So let's do that. Um, let's work on that through the cello. Or um, let's use the vibrations of the cello and match them with, you know, auditory um, sounds and cues and have them really feel to, to his sound as well. So is it painful for him to do any kind of, I could you, I'll describe his. So, so his he would have his cello lessons handy. at the end of the day, end of the day, and usually by the end of the day, he has both thumbs in his mouth and he's crying because he's tired and done. But he would really pay attention and did fairly well for most of the times that they would meet, even at the end of his day when he was exhausted. Which really speaks to the fact that I think he really has a true joy with the cello lesson and he gets real, you know, beauty out of that. So, so how painful, or could you describe his, his... I I wish I could, but he's never spoken yet, and so I don't know exactly. And, you know, it's very hard to know. I do know he gets very upset when he does physical therapy, because he does get so tired quickly. Um, so in answer to your question, I'm not sure, but I know it's a big effort for him. And some days more so than others. When he's had a seizure the night before, the next day he's definitely more tired, and it's more difficult. But yet he rises to that occasion because of the beauty and the joy that I think he gets from so it. So he's being treated possibly through medicines? Oh, or yes, no? yes, for epilepsy, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he takes um, a special medicine from England. It's the only one of its kind um, derived from the cannabis um, plant. It's made of CBD, and it helps him to manage, but it doesn't take them away. So it helps him to have a good, high quality of life. Um, it helps to manage, but it's not perfectly take them all away always. How did you make the transition? I, I gather that he, he now has the the cello backward, right. back the way it, it usually right, is. Yeah. How did you make that transition? I think we did that during our virtual lessons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, at first it was just, well, let's just lean it on him for a little bit. And um, we were finding the right chair, too. That was a big thing. Uh, finding the right chair. We have a stool that we use. It's all about the ergonomics. Uh, yeah, it really is. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, he took to it pretty well with it leaning on him. And I do 
think Nancy exposed him to a lot of cello videos, a lot of cello music, she herself playing cello. Um, so I'm sure, you know, seeing visually, you know, okay, cello leans on me uh, may have helped. Um, and so he was actually playing it the backwards? Well, part? yeah, I was just holding it for him and, and he would reach out and he would work on things okay. that way. Color-coded strings and you know, working on most, uh, another big thing we were working on is arm extension. Um, when I first met Alex, yeah, he, really tight. Yeah, he pulled a lot in here. Um, and then by having him reach for the cello, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's what helped him. Okay, now I reach it around, still the mm -hmm. same, but just around the cello. Um, okay. Has this ever been done before, ever? To teach what? somebody with Situation. Yeah, yeah. I for two years. Yeah, you, for two years you did what? Yeah, with the cello turned around. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I just kind of went with my gut there, and and uh, but I'm not sure. That that's a great question. Um, but you don't know if it's ever been achieved to this extent that you have. No, I mean, I, I know there are performers um, with Down syndrome who play violin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they have you know, hypotonia, but definitely I've had students. I had a student with cerebral palsy um, shortly after Alex. Mm -hmm. She's since moved to a different um, state. But uh, for her, she had, I think it was like only like 20% mobility in, in one arm. Um, so that, you know, I was considering, do we switch things around? You know, how do, do we, do we play this backwards? And, um, you know, just looking at other players, players who are missing a limb, who are still able to play with adaptations and accommodations and modifications. <laughs> so, um, just kind of drawing from all that. And well, we hope you come back so that you can actually hear a video. Yeah. Here. Here. Yeah, they're yeah. on, they're on YouTube. We have, um... <laughs> Well, his beginning lessons, his first lessons, we, we kind of stopped videoing him after um, a while, but we do have, I guess yeah. we have some current, current yeah. some current yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, That's what I was going to ask you. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm not sure you have a video that you can yeah, show us. We yeah, we probably do. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to. I'm sure it's yeah. oh. <laughs> Next time, yes. Yeah. yeah. If you want to send Nancy, if you want to send me a link, I can send it out yes, to the. It's on my website, definitely. Oh, all right. Yeah, right. www.upnotdownbook.com. Yeah. Everybody get that? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Upnotdownbook.com. Yeah. Jessica, do you have a question? Well, Inkwa, I wanted to ask you because I read the book and so much of it in there, you were really second guessing your methods because yeah. it was against the classical that you had learned. Yeah. And now that you have had this success, and just by trusting your gut, which yeah. I think is, I applaud you for that. Um, have more people started to come to you? Are you learning that, you know, this, you know, are you teaching others? Um, well, I would, I, I have, I guess around like 300 students though, <laughs> around there, um, but not as, as much as I think I, would like to see in a, in a way like I um, I have students who um, have cochlear implants who I you know I, I have them in a different group most often because we just need to make sure they have access to the to the lesson in different ways than some of the other students they still participate with the orchestra just like we're, <coughs> we're trying to get Alex to yes, play thanks, with my fourth grade orchestra <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think I would like to maybe see more families be encouraged to, to sign up. And after hearing Nancy's perspective of what getting that sign up form was like, um, <laughs> you know, I fear that other parents feel that way too. They go, well, my child can't handle this, or, you know, we, we can't do this. This is not, you know, in the cards for us. So, um, yeah, I, I wonder sometimes how to encourage, encourage more, you know, like, keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 
Susie online says, beautiful, so inspiring. Thank you. He does. He goes to a public school, um, but he gets a lot of support. He has a team. Um, in my first book, I talked about how there's no I in team. So it's a huge entourage of people. He has OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, a personal care assistant, special education plan, and lots of people that help to support him. But he is in this school, and it's a real heterogeneous grouping of students, and they get to know him, which is beautiful. They do a lot of great, great things. Very lucky. <laughs> I was just thinking years ago that probably wouldn't have been possible. No, no. My first book, um, Up Not Down Syndrome, was part of a play called A Fierce Kind of Love, where they interviewed generations of women with children like Alex. And you're right. It was very different for many years. It was not, not like this. So you're absolutely right. Have you ever gotten any pushback from anybody about the amount of service that, that he gets in a public school? Not necessarily exactly pushback, but he doesn't get probably as much therapy as he would if he were going to a private setting. Because so maybe he might sit up straighter, but he wouldn't have the exposure to all the students. Uh -huh. So it was kind of um, yeah, like mm -hmm. it's a good good point. But yeah, he he gets what the public school can provide, and we're lucky with what he gets. I know right. that there are some schools that may not even have as much as he gets. So right. it's very lucky. Um, where he is. Yeah. <laughs> this is a silly question, but does he rest at all, or how does he rest at night, and do you rest at night if he doesn't so rest? He loves to go to bed right when Jeopardy starts. He always goes to bed at 7. He is a very, he loves, you know, sticking to his routine, Aww. and we, we rest, but he started getting epilepsy at age three, so we always kind of keep one eye open and an ear for him through the night because of the seizures. They only really happen at night. So it's, um, I think it, it, rest is a challenge, <laughs> but we do our best. I know a local chiropractor, and some people might not understand this, but uh, the spine, the nervous system, sometimes at birth can be misaligned, and he works and right now he is uh, learning to, the, the chiropractor is local, he got a grant, a scholarship to learn about brain injury. And I had a lot of injuries when I was little, a lot of falls. I don't know what my struggles were, but he has helped me tremendously with my balance. Whenever uh, I was little, I had trouble talking and reading. When I finally went to the chiropractor in Pittsburgh, he said, hey, did your mother have a difficult delivery? And I said, well, why are you asking that? At the base of my skull, there was such a twist. Right at the base of the skull, he believes that when I was birthed, my head was twisted and I was yanked down the birth canal. Yeah. He has really aligned me because of that. Now I can speak better, read better. Yeah. But uh, I would like to offer uh, just an uh, opportunity to see that maybe uh, I'm not saying he can be cured, but he may be able to be helped. Now Mark knows I won't shut up. <laughs> I talk too much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom like to chime in? <laughs> so uh, how were you able to write your book? I mean, it's... So How the, long did it take? The first book, Up Not Down Syndrome, <coughs> took 10 years. Um, I would do it every morning before I would go to teach my full-time job, and then it was finished. This one, I wrote and lost it after a year and had to rewrite it, and it came out better. <laughs> so it really quickly together. It was like a much better thing. So, yeah, about a year. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I don't know. <laughs> I Roughly, think so. give or take. It was the pandemic. Yeah. We're not really sure. <laughs> and but, um, and they, who, who helped you publish it, or was there a difficulty in getting it edited or published? So we had a wonderful editor, um, Darlie's Lyons, and then we had a friend go through it again, um, Noriko uh, Lovas, and then Susie Garber, who's on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and Modern History Press um, published it. Darlie's, I feel like, was great at, because I've never written a book she had, she had and, you know, um, but I, you know, I was very, I was terrified mostly because I'm not, I, I'm not that experienced, so I was like, 
oh goodness, what, what am I going to say? You know, how, I, I, it was easy to put it into words, but um, it was like, do I want other people to read it? <laughs> because, well, <laughs> like, what, what, what credibility do I have um, other than my experience? And I think Dara Lee's really helped with that. Um, Nancy, too. Nancy just saying, just write about your experience and, you know, asking the right questions and prompting. Where did you get the funds to get it published? Um, so we're thankful to have the publisher publish it. So yeah, just yeah, very thankful that it's in the world. Um, it's very thankful. It, is the publisher local? Or he is out of Michigan. Ooh. So yeah, he's in Michigan. They should make a movie. <laughs> that's that, that's that idea. Actually, someone at King's College said there was someone interested in making a movie of my first book, but I haven't heard back yet. Be nice, that would be fun. <laughs> Put that in your schedule with all your other <laughs> She's only in two pit orchestras where it's full time. Getting married. Right. <laughs> while well, you're both amazing. Yeah, you are. Right. you yeah. guys. Thank you so much for coming out on a weeknight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys Thank you. for coming out, for sharing the story. Remarkable story. Anyone else on Zoom? Last call. All right. Well, thank you for showing up, everyone here, and those on Zoom. Thanks for tuning in, and have a good night.